Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 to chapter 11, verse 1. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Our passage today in Matthew is a, such a perfect passage for Mission Sunday. For one obvious reason, and that is that if you've been around for the past few weeks, you will know that Matthew chapter 10 is Matthew recording for us the second of five of Jesus' major sermons that Matthew records this discourse named the... Missions Discourse, you could have guessed that from Mission Sunday, but that's what we call it, Matthew chapter 10. This one major sermon of Jesus that we've looked at for two weeks and we end tonight is the Missions Discourse. So that's a great fit. But especially because of the last three verses of chapter 10, so Jesus' closing of the Missions Discourse is such a perfect text for Mission Sunday. And the reasons for that may not be immediately obvious, but you'll see when we get there. However, as you may have picked up from the reading, we have quite a lot of work to do before we get to those last three verses. A lot of work which includes some tough stuff, hey? I mean, honestly, for me, if you had to make a list of the hardest things that Jesus said, it's quite a long list, but most of the references on that list of the hardest things Jesus said would appear in this closing part of his missions discourse. And so to help with that, because we're going to wrestle with some tough stuff tonight. So before we actually get into the passage, let me try and help by calibrating your expectations a little bit. And so when it comes to preaching, not necessarily mine, but, but of course that too, and, and preachers, but, but the sermons of Jesus, preaching in general, when it comes to preaching, there are many 
categories, if you like, uh, of instruction that fall under the banner of preaching. So when the Apostle Paul writes to young Timothy, a young pastor, and gets to the point of preaching, he says, hey, be ready to preach in and out of season. And then he says this, so in your preaching, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Now notice those three words. That's part of what preaching, any preacher but Jesus' sermons, includes reprove, rebuke, and exhort. If you're reading an NIV, it says correct, correct people, <laughs> rebuke, and encourage. But that's part of, of what instruction includes those aspects to it. And if you think about it, when you were, as I'm imagining, you getting ready to come to church tonight, you were having your nice lunch, you're like, hey, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm keen to go to church tonight because I am really in the mood for some rebuking. And I just really hope that when I get to church, I'm gonna be sternly corrected. Now, that's not ordinarily, I would, I would not imagine that that would be part of what went in your head. You're looking forward to coming. It's five night. That's going to be awesome. You're going to see your friends. That's awesome. Maybe you will, when it comes to the preaching part of Sunday, Sunday's more than preaching. But when it comes to the preaching part, you're like, I could do with some encouragement. That's here. But even then, the similar word to encourage, it's similar but different, the word exhort, exhort means to strongly urge someone to do something, strongly urge someone to do something. And I'm bringing that one up in particular because a large part of this section of Jesus' missions discourse includes exhortation, strongly urging us to consider something or to do something. And so just want you to note that as we get that, that's what he's going to do with us tonight. But even as I mention some of these categories, if you've been around the last few weeks, you might start to think about all of the other aspects that he's covered in this great sermon. So I want to just run through, just outline so you just know where we're headed tonight. But this great missions discourse. So on the opening week, Justin preached that sermon from verse 5 to 15. For me, as I'm processing it, he starts out with instruction. That's another category category under preaching instruction. And the instructions given to the 12 then, remember there's some very practical instructions. Take no money bags with you. So it's instruction. Then it was followed by warning. And the warning was, hey, not everyone is going to accept this message. So that was 5 to 15, instruction, then warning. Last week, as we went from verse 16 to 23, carried on with the warning part. And remember the warning was, I mean, quite clear. I am sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves. So there was warning and then encouragement. And if you remember from last week, it actually was double stacked. There was warning, encouragement, warning, encouragement. And encouragement, remember, part of it was, when they bring you on trial, don't worry about what you're gonna say. The spirit of your father will give you words in that hour. So instruction, warning, warning, encouragement. Now today in this last bit, which is quite a lot, I kinda wish I'd broken it up over a few more weeks, but here we are. This last bit, so verse 24 to 39, starts with encouragement. So it's gonna be good, gonna be some encouragement, but that is followed by exhortation. It's heavy, strongly urging us to consider and to do something. And then thankfully, this great sermon ends with another bout of encouragement. So you know, just so you know tonight, that's how we're headed. We're going to start with encouragement. We're going to end with encouragement, but there's a big bit of meat in the middle of exhortation. Now I've realized in preaching through today and, and wanting to really make sure, and I don't think I quite did it, so I'm going to do my best tonight. Uh, really want to make sure when we get to verse 40 to 42, there's a strong mission Sunday that you don't miss that, which means that the opening bit of encouragement, I'm going to rush through, right? And I know that's not helpful, but hopefully seeds of encouragement will be dropped in you. So we're going to fly through the opening encouragement bit because I think we need to sit under the exhortation bit and then hopefully be able to dwell on the Mission Sunday part. You with me? You got it? You guys got capacity tonight? Tomorrow's a public holiday. We could be until 11, right? Actually, I don't need to, I don't need to rush through that. Some of you were here last night till like 11 watching rugby, and uh, how well did that work out for you? Right? So, so we stay tonight, like it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be, yeah, I, I'm kidding. We are gonna rush through the first bits and just, by the way, if you're part of a community group, that's what's so helpful is things that I don't get to dwell on, you get to dwell on in your group. So if you're ready, 
Right, let's get going on the encouragement part. So in verse 24, we are reminded that disciples should expect opposition and Jesus' reasoning is, look how they treated me. How much worse will they treat you? A disciple is not above his master, he says. And so he sets the expectation again. You will experience opposition. But despite the reality that things are gonna be really tough for you because you're my disciple, despite that, Jesus says three times, and let's see if you are paying attention to the scripture reading. What thing did Jesus say three times? He says, three times, do not fear. Do not fear. And that's kind of, that's another, like, it's almost like we're talking about encouragement, but that's almost a command, an instruction. Do not fear. Three times, do not fear. Now think about this with me. If, hypothetically speaking, you are with your spouse or your friend, and they are really, really anxious and afraid, and you say to them, don't be afraid. How helpful is that? How does that work? Right, someone is really, really, like, I'm terrified. Don't be you know, it's, it's our wish it were that easy that we had a switch that our spouse could control. In fact, they could use that against us. So, so maybe not. They could switch on fear when there shouldn't be fear. But the point I'm trying to make is when you hear, don't be afraid, that, that's not helpful. It's only helpful if the person explains why what you are afraid of is in fact something you need not be afraid of. You with me? I like the classic children's story of Chicken Little worried about the sky falling on his head. And if you had to explain to Chicken Little, that's not how cosmology works and gravity is quite a solid thing. You don't have anything to worry. And if Chicken Little could understand that, he would not be worried about that, right? No? Okay, well, you get kind of what I mean. So this is what Jesus is gonna do. He's not just saying, don't be afraid and moving on. He's gonna explain why what we're afraid of is not what we should be afraid of. And he gives three reasons. Three motivations, why you should not fear. Again, going through this quickly. So firstly, I'm going to call it vindication. So he says, so have no fear of them. The people coming against you, have no fear of them because nothing is covered that will not be revealed or nothing is hidden that will not be known. Now he's referring here to the end, his return. Spend some time on that last week that that's where we were, the son, the son of Man portion. So he's referring to the end. And part of what, based on this and other passages we can expect, is a time of everything being revealed. Everything. And here in this context, the idea is every wrong that has been perpetrated against you because you are a disciple of Jesus, or every harm that has befallen a disciple of Jesus, everyone will be exposed. There's nothing that's happened. There's no harm that's befallen a disciple of Jesus that will not be exposed. On the flip side of that, we could perhaps deduce that equally every act of faithfulness of obedience by a disciple of Jesus will be revealed. That's encouraging, isn't it? Because we as human beings, when we do difficult things, it's kind of nice when people see and acknowledge what we've done, whether it's around the house or whether it's in the workplace. It's just nice to know that it's been noticed. So that's an encouragement. God sees every act of faithfulness and obedience. But equally so, every harm that has befallen his disciples gets revealed. Now, if we're just thinking on that. Okay, so God knows. He knows everything. And it gets exposed. How is that encouraging? Okay, let me just give you one little thing to think about. In our household, I have two little kids. You would have seen, their, they've seen them there earlier. Hypothetically speaking, should they get entangled in a bit of an argument with each other? It doesn't happen in my house but I've heard it happens in other people's houses. That for example, hypothetically speaking, Emma Rose would run in, go, Benjamin snatched my toy from me, or Benjamin would run in and say, Emma Rose hit me, you know, but I wasn't there. Like parents maybe help me out here, hypothetically speaking. What does one do in that situation? I mean, for me, I'm normally just gonna like palm it off and say, Ben, stop stealing your sister's toys, MROs, stop beating up your brother. You know, like, what can you do? You just kind of put that out there and move on. 
because I wasn't there. But if I see it happen, if I see it, then I can act justly, right? And so the encouragement here is God sees everything, the good and the bad, and God will act appropriately and justly. So the encouragement to disciples is simply, we put our heads down and we carry on doing what we know we are supposed to do, which is faithfully live out our lives the way Jesus has instructed us and acknowledge him and testify to him when opportunity presents itself. Carry on doing that, put our heads down and trust that we are under his watchful eye. He knows, he sees, and he will act appropriately at the right time. Amen? Second, encouragement that he gives here, I put under the banner of awe or fear. Let's talk about that one, the next instance of do not fear. Verse 28, and do not fear those who kill the body. Let's just pause there. Do not fear those who kill the body. Is that a realistic fear that we have? Of course it is. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. So just start thinking with me, this is what Jesus is doing. There are fears that are legitimate, but what he's trying to say that the things we're afraid of are not, in fact, the things we should be afraid of. So don't, kill, don't fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Who's that referring to? Like mankind, that, that happens. Persecutors, but generally speaking, don't fear those who have authority, yes, over your physical body, but not your soul. Rather, hear this, rather fear him, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so despite the fact that Jesus says three times, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, he does not mean that disciples should not fear anything. It does not mean that Christians take the word fear and remove it from their vocabulary. Right, it is appropriate to fear. Notice, do not fear them. Instead, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And who's that? Who has that authority over hell and eternal punishment? It's only God. So don't fear them because they can, they can kill you, but they can't harm you. Actually, that's a quote from one of the early church fathers, like very close to the time of Jesus witnessing to one of the emperors in a time of great persecution against the church. And he says, you can kill us, but you cannot harm us. Like truly harm, meaning that soul level, this punishment part, that's under, that's under God. And so it is appropriate to fear, but it is only appropriate to fear God. Are you with me? I mean, let me just summarize for you again. I'm summarizing, but I think important the resounding view of the Scriptures, all of them, the Bible, when it comes to the subject of fear is do not fear man and do not fear evil spiritual forces. Beware of them. Make no mistake. They are a reality. Like mankind is vicious and cruel. So beware of evil people and beware of evil spiritual forces, but we are never told to fear them. Instead, fear only God. And so in case you missed it, the irony here is that fear drives out fear. But it's fear in the wrong places, which is only fear of the, the harm that other humans can perpetrate against us. But fear in the wrong places is driven out by fear in the right place, by the sense of awe, of respect, this holy fear fear of God. Now, I'm not going to pretend that that's easy, but that's part of why Christians come together and worship, to continuously have the sense of who God is and His authority and have a right perspective of everything else. So fear in the right places, in the right place, drives out fear in the wrong places. And part of the Christian journey is that sense of experiencing less fear in the wrong places because of a healthy worship of God. Number three, encouragement. The last encouragement links to the first. Not only does God know, he knows, he sees everything and will act appropriately at the end, but the last little bit of this encouragement is this beautiful verse about the sparrows. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground 
apart from the Father. So just listen to Jesus' words. That's how sovereign He is over every living being. Not even a tiny little sparrow falls to the ground dead apart from the will of the Father. That's how much He's in control of everything. And in case you missed it, Jesus says, even your, the hairs on your head are numbered. The implication is not only does He know when a sparrow falls to the ground dead, but He knows how many hairs you lost yesterday. When you wake up in the morning and brush your hair and you look at your comb, again, hypothetically speaking, go, sure, there's quite a bit of hairs there. God's like, yeah, 362. There's way more than you thought. Like he knows and he's over every single detail. Again, summarizing here. And we're just try to be clear with the words that I say because I don't have time to explain it. But disciples may never fully grasp why God permits persecution. This is something we spoke about last week. If you want to go back and have a listen to that. But still to say disciples may never fully grasp why God permits persecution. But make no mistake, the reality of opposition, it is a reality. The reality of opposition does not nullify the truth of God's omnipotence that He is fully powerful and fully in control. Just because there's opposition does not mean that God is not powerful and not in control. And again, like the fear thing, it it takes great faith and a journey of discipleship to live in that space of believing that. May God do that in our lives. Amen? That's the encouragement part. It was supposed to be encouraging. Hopefully it was. Now we get to the exhortation section, the strongly being urged to consider and to do. And so I want to, this is where I did want to spend some time. I think there's a couple of important things here. And I actually want to start with the part near the end of the exhortation and then go to the beginning. You'll see why. So the last words in this section, the exhortation, are very well known, but not very well understood all the time. So let me read them again. Verse 32. So everyone who acknowledges me, Jesus says, before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But... Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. I don't know if this is still the case, but it seems like quite a long time ago, I don't know, five, six, seven, maybe 10 years ago, this passage became super well-known because there was a phase when people were WhatsApping this text to each other or posting it on Facebook. And kind of the implication was, here's this verse, acknowledge it or not. So if you don't like this post or if you don't post it on your page or if you don't forward this WhatsApp, well, then you're going to hell. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm speaking about? I don't know if it's still the case today, but suffice to say back then, I was like, man, there's something off here. And there is. The context here is the sense of real opposition, of persecution, of being asked in my mind, the sense of this direct sense, are you with Jesus? And the idea is acknowledging Him or denying Him. The sense here is not, by the way, as I see it, the necessity of being able to give a very eloquent speech and convince and persuade your hearers. That's a good thing if you're able to do that. That's evangelism. But here it's just the sense of, are you with Jesus? Yes. And so it does not need to be this eloquent speech. And even then, Let's be honest, for some people, probably not most of us, but for some people in some family situations, in their workplaces, our missionaries in closed countries, answering that question is not easy. And I I love a friend of mine who's who's actually sitting here tonight, the way he said it when he was speaking about this passage is that even if in your own battling way, you acknowledge Jesus, he will acknowledge you. One more little thing, just encouragement on top of that, just to think about is in this situation, as you're speaking about disciples under pressure, perhaps being asked, are you with Jesus? And going, no, I'm not. Can anyone think of a situation? We're not there yet in Matthew, but can anyone think of a situation in the Gospels where a disciple under pressure was asked if they were with Jesus and the disciple cracked under pressure? Anybody? If you're thinking, Peter, absolutely, you should be. Because expressly we are told at least two of the three occasions, this word, this same word for deny is used of Peter denying Jesus. And what what happened as a result? Did Jesus cut him, cancel him? You're out, you're done. Now remember the marvelous story of the restoration of Peter where three times he's asked, do you love me? Feed my sheep. All that to say, 
I know a lot of Christians as well struggle with, I had an opportunity, I didn't take it, this is me now, I'm gonna be denied before the Father and have false guilt and false fear. Just to say, all is clearly not lost if you have failed under pressure. But let's not miss the weightiness of this. Christians must grow in their capacity to boldly acknowledge that they are disciples of Jesus when required. Amen? That's what's there on the surface. But I actually wanna go just one level below the surface because there's something here in this passage that speaks a lot about this final judgment. And I think that's something we have to have before us here. So one of the big takeaways here, actually, besides just acknowledging Jesus when required, one of the big takeaways is what's here is very explicitly the means by which we are judged. In other words, the standard or the metric used for judgment, quite simply here, is our opinion on Jesus. He who acknowledges me I will acknowledge before the Father. He who denies me, I will deny before the Father. When it comes to judgment, there's a lot to be said, but this is, seems to me to be the simplest version of it, is Him, Jesus. Who is He? And He who acknowledges me, I acknowledge He who denies me. So the means is, when it comes to judgment, the verdict is based on our stance when it comes to the person of Jesus. So note that. But also note here that he is also, so not only is he the standard by which we are measured, but he is also the one who ultimately is in control of our judgment. I try to say that clearly and, and maybe I'll think about it a different way, but, but here's what I'm thinking. Here's what's in my mind. We as Christians are very good Trinitarian Christians, aren't we? because Justin preached an awesome series on the Trinity. And so we are God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, just quick question, off the top of your head, when it comes to the subject of judgment and God's judgment, which of the three members of the Trinity normally comes to mind when one thinks of judgment as the one who judges? Which of the three? Is it Father, is it Son, or is it Spirit? Ordinary, thank you. That's exactly what comes to my mind. Our impression is God the Father is the one who's distant, He's very stern. He's very hard to please. He, when it comes to judgment, he's the one over the judging part. Our impression sometimes of God the Son is that like it's like, it's like bad cop, good cop. And Jesus the Son, is the, he's the really nice guy going, oh, come on, Dad, please, he's not that bad. Go we just swing him in here. You know, just that's our impression of Jesus. But notice here that when it comes to the verdict against the person being judged, Jesus is the one giving the verdict. I will acknowledge Him before the Father. I will deny Him before the Father. Yes, judgment is under God the Father, but the verdict is based, is the Son giving the verdict. So note that the Son is the one who is involved here in the judgment and the judgment is based on our impression of God the Son, Jesus Christ. As heavy as this is, this is heavy, there's actually some encouragement in this. Are you keen for some little bit in this part? Yes, he has the encouragement. Loyalty to Jesus, yes, loyalty to Jesus may, will, result in some persecution now. But that loyalty to Jesus will result in his loyalty to us on Judgment Day. In other words, our loyalty gets rewarded in Gus when it counts. But his loyalty, our loyalty to him is noticed and results in that loyalty I will acknowledge before my father. That's the first part of the exhortation, acknowledge and deny. The next part of the exhortation, I'm not gonna spend time on tonight because I don't have time, but also we dealt with it last week, right, the the devastating idea that even families will be torn apart because of their position when it comes to Jesus. The third part of the exhortation that I do want to spend some time on is the introduction to the hard part of the sermon. And it is for me, got to be up there with top five hardest things Jesus ever said. So it's here in verse 34. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. So you have to read these things slowly and go, hang on, does that say what I, 
what I just read. Do not think, Jesus says, that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. So let's, let's wrestle with this a little bit. So question time, does Jesus bring peace? Now, you know that's a loaded question. You know that's a trick question. So obviously, he says, I've not come to bring peace, so why am I asking it to you in this way? Because it is a trick question. Does Jesus come to bring peace? The answer is yes and no. And to put it in the simplest way that I can possible, yes, Jesus brings peace to those who are with him. But to those who are not with Jesus, they should not expect peace. You with me? Let me elaborate a little bit on that. Coming up quite fast, it seems, on Christmas time. I know for a lot of people that's like brings fear, but that, this stuff's out there. And so Christmas time, almost every single year, rightly so, we reflect on some of the prophecies of the birth of Christ, one of them, Isaiah 9. For to us a child is born, a son is given. Remember this? Right, wonderful counselor, everlasting father, mighty God, and prince of peace. So we, I mean, Christmas, we really do. We reflect on, on peace on earth and goodwill to man. We like, we sing about that stuff. So Jesus brings peace, right? He's the prince of peace. Well, in another classic Christmas passage, when the angels and the shepherds and the angels are singing, like flash mob, it's awesome. Listen to what they say. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. I didn't put that scripture up on the screen, did I? Do we have that one? No, okay. The angels sing, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Amen? Is that where it ends? Doesn't end there. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And among those with whom he is pleased. We often forget about that part. And at Christmas we reflect on peace, on earth peace, but forget that among those with whom he's pleased. That's what I'm trying to say. For those who are aligned with him, who acknowledge him, who follow him boldly, peace. They experience peace. The promise of peace, church, the promise of peace is a promise that is attached to acceptance of Jesus as Messiah, Savior. Rejecting him cannot and does not lead one to the idea of peace. It's the opposite. That's why you will read just later in the Gospels, this was in our mind because we were in Israel, as you know, a few weeks ago, and you, know, you walk down the Mount of Olives and you come to a place where they commemorate the spot where Jesus weeps weeps. He looks out over Jerusalem and he weeps. And these are his words. So when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, and he's crying, he's broken saying, would that you city, would that you, even you had known on this day, the day he's entering Jerusalem, this day, if you had known what my coming means, the things that make for peace, his coming. Yes, there's peace attached to it, but now they're hidden from your eyes. They will reject him as Messiah. And he goes on to say, and so what's gonna happen is just, there will be enemies surrounding you, hostility, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't know that peace was accessible, but you rejected it because you rejected me. Are you starting to hear what I'm saying about peace? Yes and no. Yes to those who receive and accept the Messiah, but no to those who don't. And I, I'm saying this because there is sometimes in Christian circles, I mean, let's be honest, in every religion, there's something about peace. It's so attractive. So everyone wants to talk about peace, but sometimes there's some naivety around the concept of peace from a Christian perspective. The promise was never instant, universal, serendipitous harmony when Jesus came. Like all of a sudden, everyone's just gonna magically get along. That was never the promise. For the promise is for disciples, there is peace. And listen, we're going to celebrate this later with communion. Primarily, there's peace between man and God. Amen? Peace. There's therefore no longer hostility between man and God. So for disciples, there's peace with God. For disciples, there's the opportunity of peace amongst fellow disciples, brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus will say, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. 
So there's the possibility for disciples of peace amongst mankind. And yes, believers, guys, please get this. For believers, there is the promise of future, universal, serendipitous harmony. Amen? Like that's what's in our future. We are absolutely looking forward to that. And you know I love to go to some of these passages that are still in our future. I want to bring just this one up to you. I think what you'll see is obvious reasons, but Isaiah 11, one of the ones I love, speaking of this time of universal serendipity, says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Does that sound familiar? Well, yes, because Jesus has just said, I'm sending out like lambs, like sheep amidst wolves, like you're under threat. But at that time of universal serendipitous harmony, wolves and sheep getting along famously. So we can expect that in our future, but now, now there will be hostility because of our allegiance to Jesus. And for those who are not believers, what are the prospects of peace? Well, no peace with God apart from Christ, amen? Really no chance of peace amongst different nationalities. So just thinking Heritage Day and Ephesians 2, I'll read, I'll read that later in communion, but the dividing wall of hostility broken down between Jews and Gentiles and therefore the opportunity for every nations and races that are previously in conflict because of Jesus, there's the chance for harmony. But for those not, like no, no chance. So no chance of peace with God, no real chance of peace with fellow mankind No way to think about peace in the future. Not in light of the context of what some of the things Jesus is saying, like the concept of hell, which we didn't even really get into. The concept of peace is real, but church, it is entirely conditional based on our perception of and acceptance of and declaration of allegiance to Jesus the Messiah. Amen? Can do with some encouragement, right? So we get finally to the last three verses of this Sermon of Jesus, and it is an encouragement, and it is a fantastic Mission Sunday part. Here's the encouragement. It's, it's, it's to two groups of people. It's actually Jesus shifts here a little bit. He's still talking to his disciples who are about to go on a missionary assignment, but he refers to other people who will support them on their missionary assignment. So he's actually now talking to two groups of people. So he has the encouragement to both groups of people. One, to those who are about to go on the missionary assignment. So to those who now today take seriously the assignment to proclaim Jesus. And yes, our missionaries, if they're listening, and I hope they are, the encouragement to those who are on missionary assignment with Jesus, who are suffering, the encouragement is that at the end of the sermon, other disciples will support you and will give you relief. You can expect the community of disciples to gather around you and support you. You will be supported. That's what Jesus says to those going out. But right? anyone who receives you receives me, and if receives me, receives the Father. And everyone who receives a prophet gets a prophet's reward. And a righteous person, i.e. a disciple, gets, gets a reward. But then your encouragement is, you, guys, it's gonna be tough but you're gonna be well supported by the larger group of disciples. That's the encouragement to those on the assignment. He has the encouragement to those doing the supporting that as you, and I mean, this is Mission Sunday. I mean, Mission Sunday, I absolutely wanna make clear, we still need missionaries. Hey, Jenny, Jenny here anywhere? Like we don't have the funds yet, but we'll get the funds, right? We still, there she is. We still need missionaries, yes? So the call goes out. For missionaries, but for for the most part, as we've gathered today, most people are not going to take those particular assignments. Their assignment will be at home and in the workplaces and the social spaces. So there's this call to be those on that particular assignment. But for most of us, the call and the opportunity is to be in this group of people who receive, who support, who provide even a cup of cold water to the disciples. And yes, I picked up this bottle because... Last minute, I suggested to Jenny that we make cool labels and put them on bottles of water so you could go get a bottle on the way and you could put it on your shelf and look at it every single day and read about the cup of cold water given to disciples because it it represents even the most basic need, water being given, Jesus says, to little ones. And no, that's not specifically referring to children. 
I know when I've read that passage before, the idea has always been, you know, maybe Christians need to go and, and sink wells in dry places in Africa, and, and they should do that, but not based on this passage. This is referring to little ones here means the insignificant. In other words, missionaries or people on a missionary assignment who are not getting the great coverage. They're just going largely unnoticed. Even if you meet their most basic need, a cup of cold water, he will by no means lose his reward. So don't miss this. Here's the encouragement. For those going, for our missionaries, we got your back. We'll support you. If anyone here is going and you go through all that training, we got your back. We'll support you. We'll receive you. But to the rest of us, it's because our call is to be involved in supporting and providing relief, even the most basic needs like a cup of cold water. And let me tell you, I know enough to know that our missionaries, a lot of them need a lot more at this stage than just basic needs. And so the call goes out to go, but the call absolutely and the opportunity goes to us to be continuously supporting our missionaries. And the promise is you receive the same reward as they do. I get this reward stuff can be weird, but can we just read the passage and just say what it says? Jesus says, if you receive a prophet, if you receive, you host, you support, you strengthen a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. So there's a reward for the person going, but for those who get behind the person going, what's their reward? The same. If you receive a righteous person, you receive a righteous person's reward. We are so closely aligned. Do not underestimate the need to support those on missionary assignments. We are so closely linked to one another that even the blessing attached to their ministry and their mission, what we celebrate in those videos today, we receive that same blessing when we deliberately activate our support for them. Amen? Let me pray. And then after we've prayed, we're going to share it in a time of communion together. Oh Lord, our, our Father, my Father, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what exactly to pray for because there's so much that I realize that we've covered in the words that you have authored for us tonight. These words spoken by your Son. And so I, I simply do pray that by that same Spirit that inspired these texts, that transmitted these words from all those years ago to us today, that by that same Spirit, we would be encouraged where we need encouragement. That perhaps our lives would be disrupted or made uncomfortable where it needs to be. Lord, I leave that work to you. And we all together invite you by your Holy Spirit to strengthen us where we need strengthening, but to exhort us, to strongly urge us, Lord, where we need that urging. Please let us not miss your urging tonight. And of course, we bring before you those who are on specific assignment, our beloved friends and family from this church. Some of them, especially now ministering amidst great affliction, strengthen them, Lord. Grant them a boldness to their witness, fruitfulness to their ministry. But do the same with us in our homes, in our workplaces, in our social spaces. I come before you, and I'm sure for many of my brothers and sisters in the room, we come before you acknowledging that we are faltering. We're not as bold as we could be and should be. We do not take, make use of opportunities that you give us. Grow us in our capacity to be fruitful in our witness to you, Jesus. Grant to us the boldness that we require. By your grace, do that, we pray. Amen.